But it's been my hard experience that humans and aliens don't mix. What about you and me? What about us? We can look like them. We blend in. A lot of aliens can't. And people in this world don't have much tolerance for others who look different. I say that as an alien and someone who's worn the face of a black man for 15 years. Hi, everyone out there on the internet. Uh, my name is Evan Narcissus. I'm a writer, journalist, and critic. I'm here because we're going to talk about truth, justice, in a DC Comics way. I am joined by the cast members of various DC Comics Warner Brothers TV shows. Um, we'll be talking about the characters they portray and why they're important in a world where people from outside the mainstream society often can be marginalized and treated unfairly. I'm first joined by Nicole Maines, who plays Nia Nal, aka Dreamer on Supergirl, David Harewood, who plays John Jones, Martian Manhunter, also on Supergirl, Marvin Crondon Jones, who plays Tobias Whale on Black Lightning, and Anna Joe, who plays Corey Anders, aka Starfire, on Titans. And we're also joined by Flash showrunner and screenwriter Eric Wallace. You know, obviously we're living in a world where um, we see the turmoil and the unrest born from the righteous indignation, I think, by a lot of people um, who live in systems that they feel aren't fair and don't treat, as, treat them as fully human. Um, so I guess the first question I want to ask you guys was, um, you know, if you grew up reading comic books or science fiction or any kind of speculative fiction, can you pinpoint moments where like you, you felt like your innate sense of justice or what's right and wrong was was shaped by that kind of stuff? Uh, yeah, um, I was 10 and uh, I grew up reading comic books and science fiction movies and horror movies and all that stuff and there wasn't anything for me, clearly, because uh, Spider-Man and Thor and Superman and Batman and The Flash were all white folks. And then my older sister took me to go see a movie called Night of the Living Dead. <laughs> and uh, zombies, and I fell in love with horror movies. But it starred Dwayne Jones, a black man. It blew my mind. Not only because it was the first time I saw such a powerful representation of blackness on the screen that was speaking to me. You know, it moved me. At the end of the movie, spoilers if you haven't seen Not Living Dead by now, um, he gets killed by a, a mob of quite frankly, white folks. It taught me something that I, I had kind of suspected before age 10, that my parents had talked about a little bit of their experiences in the 50s and 60s and 70s. And, but here it was right on the screen for me, a black man trying to do the right thing. And his reward for it was death. It's pretty hardcore. Uh, I've never forgotten that. Um, and it informs everything I do to this day. Yeah, you know, it, it's funny, David. Like, I feel like a lot of what you do with Martian Man Manhunter and the writers on Supergirl do is a very obvious metaphor for, you know, um, either immigration or uh, coming from in, into a, a culture which is ready to misunderstand you. Do you have, like, formative experiences from your entertainment as, as a kid or a younger person? I mean, just just going into the acting profession was going into a profession that, where I felt like a foreigner. I felt like uh, uh, an outsider. Um, and that's taken, it took a while for me to kind of get comfortable, um, uh, particularly with you know, being kind of the first generation of what you might call sort of classically trained uh, black actors in, 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 my, in, in, in London on stages in London playing characters that were, that had been essentially played by um, white actors, historically played by white actors, even Othello was played by a white actor. So it was a pretty hostile uh, first couple of years for me because they were very dismissive, uh, pretty racist. Uh, so it, it was, it, it, it felt like I was, um, it, it was, a, it was a very tough sort of, um, introduction into the profession. And I think, I think, you know, just like the Martian Manhunter, who is an incredibly powerful uh, a character, um, you know, you have to sort of, you have this sort of rage that, that's kind of within you, but you just have to, you have to find some, some way of, uh, of dispelling it and some way of controlling it. But certainly, yeah, I mean, the, the, my, my introduction to the world was into the world of, show business and acting was 
extremely, extremely tough, and I, I wouldn't really wish that on anybody. And I want to ask you a question about Starfire. Are you bringing anything personal to inform the character? I come from a planet called Tamarin. I remember I came here to Earth on this ship. What I learned about her planet was that it was destroyed and pillaged and taken over, as were many of the inhabitants on it. And then those surviving left and created a new place for themselves that was later on also destroyed and pillaged. It's called Will Run, Death, Die. Death of Worlds. And I'm from Senegal. Uh, West Africa, and similar things happened to us there. Um, it was colonized um, and destroyed in a lot of ways as well and attacked. And we rebuilt, but never really quite found our ground again either. And so I think Black people can relate a lot to Starfire's origins and where she's from. Um, I certainly can, and um, yeah, that was something I found that I that I could relate to, and also just coming to a new place. I moved to to America when I was six years old, and um, from Senegal, and I had to assimilate and had to acclimate and had to learn the language and the people, and found them sometimes odd and interesting, and all the things that Starfire finds from humans. But yeah, certainly there were a lot of similarities for me and Starfire. Yeah, um, my, pa my, my, my parents immigrated from Haiti um, before I was born. And the wildest thing to me about growing up here, I uh, identify as Haitian American, is like, you know, the stereotype, you realize the stereotypes about Black Americans get explored all over the world, right? So my mom mm -hmm. would, would invoke some of these inner conversations, I'm like, mom, you realize they, other people who are not like us probably think the same thing of us. You know, it was mm -hmm. really wild to kind of like experience that that tiered kind of like um, um, stereotyping where like, you know, oh, okay, uh, you think we're better than them, but based on what exactly, uh, uh, just from coming somewhere else. But, you know, this is one of the ways that the systemic injustice has kind of trickled down uh, to, to create fissures um, in, in uh, different communities. Uh, I want to throw the next question to Nicole because Dreamer obviously is a lot different um, in, in, in Supergirl um than in the in the original comic book source material did you uh like lean on a sense of community um to help you know ground your sense of the character and your portrayal of the character on the show yeah so for dreamer there really wasn't any source material because of course there's dream girl from the legion of superheroes comics yield or die just take it out like a, a seven yield or else I just wanted to fill her with this sense of, holy crap, I'm a superhero, and kind of take people on that journey with her because before that, we didn't have anybody. We didn't have anyone in the comics or really anywhere who was like us. We didn't have trans people in that environment and in that spotlight. Nap time. So I kind of wanted to fill her with that same excitement that the rest of the community has watching her. Because I think anytime I go to a convention or I talk to other trans people about it, we both have this sense of just complete overwhelming excitement and giddiness. I know the flip side of that can be, be feeling like, you know, like a lot of pressure. How do you modulate that? Now we're starting to see more and more representation and now we're starting to see more trans people in different situations and different shows and genres and spotlights we even have more trans superheroes now i, I see you titans um yeah and right i watch the show love the show oh thank you i know when i first started playing dreamer i was so terrified to do anything halfway indecent or halfway um bad and let her make bad choices because I was like no she has to be perfect she has to be likable like if she's not absolute perfection then you know I uh, messed it up no more trans superheroes we can't do it they're bad and but the further we got and the fur and the more representation that was out there I started feeling safe to let Nia and let Dreamer make poor choices and we saw that in uh, this past season, we did a whole episode about trans violence. He wants me to stop being a superhero. 
He's going after my community to bully me into it. Listen to me, Nia. Listen, we will find this guy. Yeah, we will. And when we do, I'll bury him. And we really saw Dreamer fall into this dark, angry, violent, vengeful place. And she kind of became this vigilante, anti-hero, full of hate for an episode. You make me sick. And I wasn't afraid to go there with her at that point because I knew that we had laid the foundation and that there was other representation to show not all trans people are like this. And it was okay for her to be angry in that moment. It, it gives me a nice segue to talk to, to Marvin because, you know, I think that's one of the things that Black Lightning is, feels so freeing about it is that, you know, it's, it's, it's a whole cast that's majority Black folks, right? And so, you know, you're a person who's, who's playing a shady character, a villain, you know, a uh, self-serving character, um, and that allows you to kind of uh, be nasty, be self-serving and egotistical in a way, which is really fun to watch. Do you feel like that adds to the discourse about what kind of representation is possible? Yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I relate to a lot to what Nicole said because um, for so long growing up, there was no representation for black people with albinism on television and in film. And when it was, it was very vague as to what the humanity of albinism entailed. Even in the comic book world, being a fan of comics and, you know, growing up in the hood, you know, and, 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 and there was no representation of the hood, even in the comics, you know, and, and from what that I was, I was watching. So, and, and when Halloween came around and it was time to pick what superhero I wanted to be, there was no superhero I felt that looked like me, you know, whether uh, melanated or the unmelanated version of black. And, 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 and that was for a lot of times disheartening. And um, I have to admit when I was in my youth, you know, I, I loved Batman and I loved Superman and these things, you know, but, but soon I found different heroes in black exploitation films that, that became my superhero, Shaft and things like that. Um, so my hat's off to Salim Akil because he had a vision to really bring a lot of humanity to the character I played Tobias well. I am unlike other men. The laws of convention and morality do not apply to me. To play a character that for so long has um, lived in a world, the DC universe, and I saw how I, I missed something here, you know, and that there is a representation and, and that there, there is a likeness that I can relate to in this world of comics. And, and when I was commissioned to play him, um, I took that responsibility you know, extremely hard, you know, and, and the, the injustices that people with albinism face around the world, the ignorance that people with albinism face around the world. Salim and, and, and CW and DC gave me an opportunity to debunk those things and create a new uh, representation and a new likeness. Finally, a brother with some heart. I really, really revel in the idea that you see the humanity in a black man with albinism, you see his origin, you see the discrimination he faced as a child from his own family, his own father and his own mother. You see what people in the neighborhood thought of him who truly were him, but just because they didn't look like him, didn't have the understanding of who he truly was. You know, they say that, um, intolerance is ignorance matured so what i'm able to do through this character is is change the narrative of that intolerance and change the narrative of that ignorance you know um you see an al a, a black man with albinism driving fancy vehicles you know and, and a lot of times when we were born with albinism we're told we never can drive and, and, and I own several cars. Um, and, and so it's, it's, a, it's a blessing to be able to defy the odds in that. And, and I think, you know, we all share this on this panel that, that we, we're, we're playing in the world that, you know, didn't necessarily invite us in, in the interim, 
but 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 we we've had to be accepted in because because you know you, you have to bring truth to power and i think that each of us individually do that in our own perspective ways um that's yeah. great Amen. Uh, my God. <laughs> David, I want to go back to you because you obviously grew up in the UK where there's a different history um, in terms of black white relations. Are there different histories that some of our, our, our viewers may not be aware of in the UK that you, you've lived through and, and kind of informed your idea of heroism? Many people in England, you know, have been have always thought that racism was an American issue. And um, they don't think they don't think there's any racism in this country. And you know, having grown up being kind of chased by you know knife wielding skinheads and and um, guys with cricket bats and 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 you know skin you know, as I skinheads, rude boys, it it, it you know for, for having grown up in this country like like that, it's 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 been sort of. Uh, it's astonishing that people feel that this is some kind, some kind of open, tolerant, lovely country, as they call it. It's 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 like I, I don't I don't, know, I don't know what country you guys grew up in, but that wasn't the country that I grew up in. So it's been it's been it's been tough because, as you say, with the Windrush generation, many of our stories just really haven't been told, haven't been rightly. Uh, you know, our, our stories have been sort of silenced um our histories have been have not been taught um so it's 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 a very it's a, it's you know even though i've you know as, i'm very lucky that because i've spent a lot of time in in the us and i can you know i, I see the power of of blackness in america and the power of black america it's very very different here in, in the uk and it's 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 been extremely difficult to make our voices heard, we don't have the organization, we don't have the numbers, and it gets incredibly frustrating because it's just hard to get those stories out. Well, like all these shows, you have these characters that have to create families for themselves, create relationships that are, that are, that empower them, you know, and Eric, I want to talk to you a little bit about like, you know, obviously, um, Barry and, 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 all the characters in the Flash like kind of have both biological and found family, and th there's a blending there. Like, why do you think that's so important to portray on the screen? I think it's important to show that mix because that's America. America it doesn't look like the shows that I often watched in reruns. You know, uh, that had all white casts. Yeah, I used to watch Lost in Space. I really like space shows, right? They're flying around and Dr. Smith and there's a robot that's all cool and they're fighting their <laughs> people. Yeah, really, right? There weren't any black people on that show. <laughs> at least not that I recall. Um, at least not until D Space Nine in the 90s. That's the show that spoke to me. But now that I'm, you know, running a show with an interracial marriage, talk about taking it seriously. Happy Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day. We have to show every week that we can be a family. We have to show every week because there's kids watching The Flash. I take it really seriously. I don't want those kids growing up with what I grew up. It has to be better, right? I don't want a black child who's 8 to 14, 22, 72. Please watch my show. <laughs> Whatever age you are. I don't want you to not see yourself. So you have that mixed uh, cast. But more importantly, you, you probably live in a world where even if you're black, you are forced, you, you're not choosing this, you are forced to leave your house at some point, leave your family and encounter a world where you are not uh, um, encountering a power structure that empowers you. You have to have the tools to deal with that. You may have to fight for yourself, you may have to educate, or you may just have the privilege of being. That's so important, to have the privilege of just existing in peace. So every week, every story I'm telling, I talk to my writers about this all the time, speak authentically. I think that's been mentioned a couple times here. Speak authentically, uh, authentically speak with the truth, um, and that family dynamic, understand that it's not just your immediate family, 
right? It's not just Barry and Iris because they are married. Um, there's the Joe and Cecile relationship, but then there's also Cisco and Camilla, right? Hispanic folks. Um, there's their daughter, Nora, from the future, Excess, who is a lesbian. All of these people matter. And I want to show them all more than just getting along. I want to show them all being themselves and getting along. That's equality. That's what I'm going for. I want to get at the idea that, you know, these characters are mutable and changeable and, and can be interpreted differently um, d depending on the needs of the story and the times we live in. So mm. let's start with you, Anna. You're, I mean, I'm putting it very mildly, but a lot of people are like, that's not Starfire. She don't look like that. So how did you, you know, find your way to like feeling confident in your portrayal of the character? She isn't from here and she has to find her way. Whatever this is you're going to, please. Let us help. And she finds a group of people that she creates family with. The Titans. The Titans. The Titans. And those are the most important things about Starfire. <laughs> her spirit to do what's right. Her courage. These are the things that I held on to because those are the things that I could relate to. It, it was uh, shocking for me. Um, when my casting was announced to get all the vitriol that I did, I, I mean, it was insane. Like, it was just, I, I didn't understand it even from a logical standpoint because she was an orange alien and not a human person that was aligned with any actual race. But um, what I did understand in that is this inherent idea that people have that white is always the um, default, right? Um, and even myself, when I read a script and it's not described as 40s male black or 40s male Hispanic or 40s male whatever, I immediately imagine a white person. And that's an issue, like that's that kind of anti work that we have to do, right? And we all need to rewire ourselves to, um, to not let that always be the default. To switch off to you, Nicole, you face a different challenge, which is the idea that like your character could spawn a whole heroic legacy. You know, mm -hmm. like one of the big metaphors of your character is like, you know, we can continue to exist. We can continue to find ways to exist deep into the future, into the future we can't mm -hmm. even imagine. Like, is that part of your process at all when you're thinking about Dreamer and, and, and how you're portraying her? Yeah, I mean, sort of what Anna was saying, the most important thing about Dreamer are the values that are important to her and the things that make up her character. And I think her transness is such a minuscule part of who she is, an important part, but it is one facet of her entire identity. And so when I'm playing her, I'm not focusing on her transness or the legacy of her transness. I'm focusing on who Dreamer is, who is Nia, and portraying her just as I would any other character because portraying her as a person is what is at the forefront of my mind. And some of the pushback I still get about Dreamer is the fact that we created this character. And people are like, oh, you had to create a whole new character just so you could shove this trans thing down people's throats. And I think there's this idea of forcing representation that's so terrible and so negative and it's such a bad thing. And I'm like, well, what? would you have us do? There was no real representation to work off of. There was, we had to kind of, you know, whip something up out of thin air uh, because that's, there wasn't anything else for us. And, you know, people were like, oh, well, why didn't you just bring Dream Girl from the future? And I'm like, well, because we wanted this representation and we wanted to create a whole new character for us to call our own, who from the jump is trans and that is who she is and that is her legacy um, moving forward. It's funny because that kind of riffs on a question I want to ask Eric, which is you guys have covered so much like territory on The Flash in terms of taking inspiration from classic storylines. Is there something that you haven't done yet that you would like to do? Yeah, I'm doing that this coming season. <laughs> and that's about all you can say about that, huh? No spoilers here, folks. <laughs> there is a particular character in the DC universe who is African-American, literally, that I've been dying to bring in 
uh, that I might have just figured out how to do it because it's so cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, you know? Uh, <laughs> I'm going to sneak it in there, and we're going to see what happens. And yeah, we'll open up. <laughs> so, so, yeah, I do struggle with it because obviously I'm surrounded by comic books behind me here. Um, but that's part of the joy of being in this world. But I will say, and uh, I don't know who, who just said it before, there's a reason why I'm drawn to this kind of material. We, we all keep saying, we all keep saying it or circling around it, because I've always felt like an outsider in the world with which I am called a minority. I do not like that word. Uh, I'm just me, you know, I'm me. Uh, and I say that, yes, I've got a lot of stories I want to tell and I'll get to them as I can, but I'm drawn to this material because I have felt to these characters, a lot of them who are outsiders, I felt the same way my whole life growing up. Um, I did not enjoy that. Um, and now again, I'll say it, I'll say it as long as people will listen to it. I don't want any more kids growing up the way I grew up. That is a mission for me. I take it so seriously. Um, I don't want kids growing up feeling outsiders. When David described Inheads running at him with bats and beating him up. I just had a flashback to when I was 16. Dude, I'm with you. Horrible, horrible experiences that should never happen to young people, especially young black folks. Um, sorry, it's just the times and George Floyd and all these things, they flow through me as a storyteller. And I talk to my staff about this all the time. And uh, all these shows that I see here, Black Lightning, Supergirl, and Titans, do such an amazing job of taking what's going on right now and infusing them, sometimes subtly, sometimes not so subtly. We're not so subtle sometimes on Flash. <laughs> it's part of the fun. But seriously, taking those things and giving them back to the audience in a way that young people can learn and say, okay, this is a better way to behave. This is a better way to get along and to be tolerant and to celebrate the inclusion of everyone. Let's celebrate that, you know? What would you guys like to see tackled on your shows in a metaphorical way? Like what, what issues would you like to see dealt with? Our show, deals with a lot of social justice issues um, from episode one. Now the issues that we're faced with have compounded. And, 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 and I'm sure that everyone here is, is um, experiencing, you know, as artists and creatives, I'm, I'm really excited to see what kind of stories we're able to tell now, the truth that we're able to tell now that an, 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 a unanimous veil has been lifted, right? I think now we have no choice as creatives and storytellers, but, but to be completely truthful, you know, with our audience, because our audience now is, is, is completely aware, I think. Post-crisis, you know, now we're all on this same earth and, and we have this amazing representation across all of the different shows. And I would like to see sort of more, minor, more frequent kind of team ups between queer people on different shows, between our black superheroes across um, across the world and sort of start to see them working together. I mean, I, I I just want like a pride team up. We could call it the Queeros and, and it's all the queer superheroes just having like a gay old time. That'd be awesome. Oh, good. Super Queeros, exactly. I would love to see, and this is something I experienced too, coming from Senegal where everyone looks like me um, and, and coming to America where not everyone looks like me and um, being confronted with what, that felt like and how I had to move differently, right? Um, and and for, for Corey, it's the same. She comes to this place and all of a sudden she's, um, she's this race um, and that means something here. And so I'd love to see us explore a moment or, or, or something where she's confronted with that as well. And, and how she responds to that. And f even further, I would love for it to be an issue 
that's big enough that her other um her other the rest of her tribe robin and raven and gar and dove notice it too and they stand up and i would love for us to portray allyship right um from these uh tribe members who happen to be white and 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 and, and gar of course who um but yeah, I think that would send such a strong message to our audience because so often I have great white friends and they don't know exactly what to do sometimes. Even I've had so many conversations. They're like, well, I don't know what to post because I don't want to say the wrong thing and I don't know how to show up for you. And and so I think it'd be great to show um, two parts, like what it is to, to, to be confronted um, by the fact of your race for Corey and then what it is for them to show up for her and what that looks like. I think it's been such a great message. That's a great answer. You know, David, um, next question is for you because in the comics, um, Martian Manhunter, there was one particular interpretation of him that showed him having secret identities all over the world, right? Yeah. So, you know, uh, in Japan, he was a woman and, you know, in, in Colombia, he was a, a little kid. So let's say you had to hand the baton off and John had to change his identity. Like who, who, would, who would you like to see um, added to kind of like the palette of inclusivity that, that's possible through a character like this? That's a really, really good question. That's a really, really good question. Um, you know, I mean, he can be whoever he wants, as you say. Right. So I think the issue with John is why is he necessarily uncomfortable with being who he is? Oh yeah, it's a little unconventional, I know, to go out wearing this face, but I like it like this. I'm just as much John Jones, the human, as I am the Martian Manhunter. It's like both myself and Magan, who's another shapeshifter, who's a white Martian, and me, who's a green Martian, we're continually being other people. And I think there's something in learning to be yourself and being happy with yourself. So if I'm going to hand this over to anybody, I'm going to hand it over to somebody who's green and somebody who's like to say, look, you know, you gotta be you gotta be honest, you gotta be comfortable with who you are. Because I think you know, we we have played with the genre choosing to to shapeshift be, because he finds his natural visage too upsetting for people. People will be too shocked. And you know, maybe we'll we'll get into a place where you know that's just no longer acceptable. You gotta be who you are, you gotta come out. I mean, so King Superman can just put on a pair of glasses and he's Clark Kent. Mm -hmm. Supergirl can just do her hair different and she's Kara and Zor El, you know, and, and I think be yourself, man. Be a big, green, beautiful self. And, and That's a beautiful message. <laughs> <laughs> and just, you know, I, I, I think it would be interesting to see how people react to that, you know, and, and see how he, how he deals with people freaking, freaking out when, when, when they see his, his natural self. How does he, how do, how, how do both he and Magan deal with the idea that they can't be their natural selves because it's too, too much for people? I think that's an interesting question. Marvin, uh, you mentioned before about wanting, you know, to talk about the prejudices that albinism faces all around the world. Yeah. You, you ready to make Tobias a hero? Like, talk to me. I think that the, the hero is the one who stands for truth. And I, I hope that my character is able to um, bring his truth, not only to power, but then also to justice, you know, in Freeland. Uh, you know, Eric, it's funny. What Marvin was saying speaks so much about personal motivation for these characters. And, you know, over like multiple seasons of The Flash, we've seen Barry mess with the timeline, you know, try to fix things. You know, uh, it, I think part of what motivates him as a character and the other heroic characters in the show is trying to imagine a world where uh, uh, things look better. Do you feel like that's uh, a vulnerability of his, like a character flaw? Drives his heroism, I feel, is his heart. As we saw in the crossover this year, he's the paragon of love. Love is a very powerful thing, perhaps the most powerful thing in the world. Love and truth, though, should go hand in hand. You know, the only way we're going to get through this is if we carry this burden together. Mary Allen is leading with love, but looking for the truth. And that's something I personally believe in. And that's something I think maybe we could all maybe follow. So do I think that's a flaw? Oh, no. I think that's the greatest thing in the world. 
how great is it that an interracial couple represents the two paragons of what I think are the most important things, love, and even though he's not the paragon of truth, we, crisis, we saw somebody else, Iris is a reporter. Her whole job is the truth. So you have this couple, to me, that goes to the world and says to the audience and says to the kids, again, every week, these are the two things that matter most. Three would be family, love, truth, family. If you honor those and you go out into the world boldly, you are unstoppable because the love that you bring is a form of compassion. That compassion will infuse others and perhaps make them act more compassionately. We need more of that in the world. The truth that Iris brings as a reporter, and want to talk about things I need to see more on television that I plan on doing more on The Flash is, we need more truth. We need people to believe in science, okay? <laughs> I think that hard. Iris can bring that with Team Citizen. And then together, because in the case of Barry and Iris, it's not one plus one equals two, it's one plus one equals three. Together, they create something that does not exist. That's family. So let's say season three Titans, they go to space. In the comics, the Titans have gone to space, gone to Tamaran, explored Corey's uh, uh, culture in, in a hands-on way. What do you want to see? How does that look like to you? It's so funny you asked this. Right before this call, I had a, um, right before this meeting, rather, I had a call with our showrunner. Um, and I pitched him an idea that we're able in season three to see Tamarin and to see the culture and the people and, and our values. And I said, and lucky you, you have an actress that's from a country that's rich in culture and we can use so much of, of Senegalese dance and, and, and music and even our fighting styles um, incorporated into this, um, what I hope will happen, this this moment where we get to see Tamron. As a fan, I would love to see that. Yeah, we want to see that. Yeah. Let's do that. Okay, so post-crisis, most of these shows, with the exception of the Titans, Titans is like a little bit gray, of a gray area, but you're all on the same earth, the same continuity, the same world now. Marvin, what character do you want Tobias to meet from one of the other shows? I really, you know, I'm a big Flash fan. So I, I, I really, I, I want to get over there. I would like to get together with Lex and, and do something crazy maniacal. Um, uh, I would like to see a static shock pop up somewhere, anywhere, anywhere. First of all, I'm still on uh marvin's suggestion of tobias and lex so i built in my mind now it's the legion of doom so it's lex it's uh tobias it's uh blood work it's trigon uh, let's get a little reverse flash in there um let's get everybody who's over on legends oh let's get back uh I almost said Ra's al Ghul. Uh, <laughs> Is he still alive? Did they kill him? Yeah, he always come back. It's, 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 I'm so sorry. I'm so distracted by his wonderful comment. I'm like, how can we pull this off? Come on, come on, come on, come on. Man. See it. Manifest your destiny. Right, right, right. Eric said something earlier about having his whole life been labeled a minority. And um, and how he kind of hates that word because he's just him, um, and I could not relate to that more in my entire life since I was five, six years old when we moved here. Um, all I've ever been was different and other, um, and. I never knew that this role was going to afford me the opportunity to. Um, meet so many fans and so many people who my casting meant so much to them, right? Um, and I get messages from Black people, I get messages from the gay community, I get messages from all types of people who, for whatever reason, have felt marginalized and other and less than because of it. I just, all that backlash I got, I would take it 10,000 times again if it meant that I could inspire them in some small way or whatever it is, because it means a lot to me to be, um, I don't know, just to, to represent all those people, yeah. myself included, that yeah. um, have just always felt other, so. It was beautiful, beautiful. beautiful. That, was, that spoke for all of us, and that spoke for 
so many and 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 it, that's everything for what you know what nicole's doing what you're doing what, what we're all doing that's the point mm -hmm. i don't care how many seasons we are here that's the point speak yeah. on it and it's forever like that's going to be that's the beauty is it can't be taken away it's forever it's <laughs> it's, it's 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 there it's it, you know what i mean it's going to reverberate for, for generations hopefully lord willing I couldn't ask for a better ending. Um, I want to thank you guys for, for taking the time out. Nicole, Marvin, Eric, Anna, David. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, thank you, everybody watching out there. Um, this has been DC Fandom. You can catch everybody on Supergirl, Black Lightning, Titans, Flash. Um, and thanks for tuning in. Mm -hmm.